Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The word of God for the people of God. And we please thank Isaac Buttery for reading the scripture for us this morning. Thank you, Isaac. <clears throat> you did a great job doing that. If I start making this sermon boring, I want you to come up here and finish it for me, okay? Well, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. <clears throat> God is good. And all the time, I'm Charles Anderson, directing pastor. It's my privilege to share with you God's word, hopefully in God's way, whether you're here in our worship area or joining us by live stream at this hour. Let me remind you that we're in a sermon series right now called Praying with Power, the Lord's Prayer. We're taking this Lenten journey to the, empty, to the rugged cross and empty tomb of Jesus Christ, taking this journey as an opportunity to look at the best teacher on prayer, Jesus and the best teaching on prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Bring them together in a way that hopefully will impact how we understand and how we practice the one prayer Jesus expects us to pray. In addition, you may recall that Pastor Lorenda and I have been saying how each sentence, each request in the Lord's Prayer is actually in and of itself a prayer. You can pray each sentence, each petition in the Lord's Prayer as an individual standalone prayer itself. Much, <clears throat> pardon me, much like a pearl in a string of pearls. The pearl by itself is something of individual beauty and significance and value. But you put the pearls together and string them in a certain way, and all of a sudden those individual pearls have a surpassing beauty, a collective value something more precious than they could have ever been by themselves. So we're looking at the prayers in the Lord's Prayer. We've looked at the Father's Prayer. We've looked at the Kingdom Prayer. We've looked at the Bread Prayer. Last week, we looked at the Forgiveness Prayer. This morning, we're going to look at the Deliverance Prayer. So let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, may the words in my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, because you are our rock and you're our redeemer. And if in the words of this one we hear not the voice of God, then please speak to each of us in the quietness of our own hearts. Amen. And do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from the evil one. Psychiatrist Scott Peck was interviewing a deeply depressed 15-year-old boy named Bobby. Bobby was there for therapy because Bobby's older brother, his 16-year-old brother, just a year ahead of Bobby, had shot himself with a 22 caliber rifle. Bobby then started spiraling into deeper and deeper depression. Well, Dr. Peck tried to connect, to see if he could make some sort of connection with Bobby, and it wasn't going well. Trying to probe his mind, and Bobby really wasn't responding. So in an effort to kind of bond with him in some sort of casual, family-based, uh, you know, regular life-based situation, he asked Bobby what his parents gave Bobby for Christmas. Bobby said, Mom and Dad gave me a rifle. Scott was stunned. He said, what kind of rifle did they give you? Bobby said, a twenty-two caliber. Scott Peck said, Bobby... Just exactly how did it make you feel when your parents gave you the same kind of gun that your brother used on himself? 
Bobby said, oh no, they didn't give me the same kind of gun. They gave me the same gun. Bobby's parents, as a Christmas present, gave the remaining child the same gun used to kill the other son. When Scott Peck finally met with the parents, the one thing that stunned him even more was how the parents deliberately took no responsibility for what was happening in that situation. Now, 20 years would go by, and 20 years later, Scott Peck converted to Christianity. And from that new perspective in his heart and mind, this, the, the Christ way of heart and mind, Peck looked back at that family. And that's when he made a frightening realization. He wrote, I now know that Bobby's parents were evil. I did not know that then. I felt their evil but I had no name for it. My supervisors could not help me name what I was experiencing. We had no word for this in our professional vocabulary. And as scientists instead of priests, we weren't prepared to deal with it. Well, time and time, over and over again, you and I, you and I have watched people we know, watched people we know and love fall into behaviors that destroyed their lives, that ruined their families, that shook their worlds, and that withered their souls. And why? Why do we... Why do we voluntarily participate in actions and behaviors that we know, we know will destroy us and damage others? Why in the world were you and I, would you and I, who were created for joy, why would we choose wreckage instead? The world may not have viable vocabulary for that, but as people of the book, we do. It's called evil. Evil. Do not bring us into the time of trial, but deliver us from the evil one. There is a power in me. There is a power in you. There is a power in the world that is working against all things good and right and true. It is a personality of opposition and damage. That's what evil really is. Evil is a power that is personally opposing all that's good in you and damaging all that's best in you. Can you think of evil as the power that opposes the good in you and damages the best in you? I think back to Dr. Scott Peck, who I was mentioning earlier. Some years later after this, he wrote what I think is the best book on evil. It's called People of the Lie. It was a bestseller, insightful book, People of the Lie. In one of, the, one of the episodes in the book, Peck tells how his ch son, as a young child, noticed that the word evil is actually the word live, spelled backwards. You hold up a mirror to the letters L-I-V-E, and it will spell evil. And that's when it struck Peck. The 
anti-reality, the anti-reality in the world that opposes all things living and all things life-giving. There's a power in the world that opposes all things living and all life-giving things. The word anti-reality is mine, but the truth is the Bible. There is this dark enemy of opposition. A dark enemy of opposition that's against life and life-giving things. It is totally irrational. It doesn't make sense, but it is making a hell of a lot of hell, literally, for all of us. And if we had time in worship today, if we turned to each other, and if we would not choke on the words out of fear and shame, we could all tell Horrifying stories of when life was spelled backwards for us. And yet Jesus says, do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus tells us to pray for God's guidance and God's rescue in the face of evil. Call this The deliverance prayer. The deliverance prayer as lead us not into temptation, but deliver. Deliver us from evil. Jesus wants to make sure that none of us ever have to go through a single day without having a really good deliverance prayer. Why is that? Why is The prayer of deliverance, the deliverance prayer and the Lord's prayer, such a Jesus gift. Well, for one, it makes me admit the reality of evil. The reality of evil. When I pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, I'm admitting that there is evil that has my name on it. Because according to Jesus, according to this prayer, There are two types of evil I must fight. And the first type is the evil I do. The evil that I'm responsible for. This prayer makes me admit that I am able, capable, and willing of unleashing such damage in the world. Which is the first part of this prayer. Do not bring us to the time of trial. Because Jesus knows that in the world, the struggle against evil has to begin in your own heart. The struggle against evil in the world has to begin in your own heart. It's what the Apostle Paul discovered. You remember Paul in Romans chapter 8 where he says, The good things I would do, I cannot. And the bad things I don't want to do, I do. Paul understood firsthand that in the struggle against evil in the world, the first place he had to deal with it was in his own life, in his own heart. And the fact of the matter is, there's not much evil, there's not much darkness you'll run into in the world that you really haven't faced first in your heart. There's just not a whole lot of bad things going on out there that I haven't thought of first in my heart. I mean, frankly, I can't speak for you, but sometimes, some days, when I'm, some days, the only difference between me and Attila the Hun is he had an army at his disposal. But praying the prayer of deliverance makes me have to admit I'm responsible for my own downfall. The greatest enemy against the enemy is me. Like that little girl whose mother, mother was so angry at her, little girl got in a fight at school. Her mother said, that's not the way I raised you. The devil must have made you do that. And the little girl said, well, mom, maybe so, but kicking her in the shins was my idea. When I pray, 
Do not bring me into the time of trial. I am admitting how often the kicking is my idea. It's my idea. It's what Martin Luther, the great reformer, called incurvatus in se. That's a little Latin. Incurvatus in se. It's Latin for curved in on yourself. He took the idea from, from an ingrown toenail. He said, our lives are like, the, like an ingrown toenail. We are growing interior. We are so self-centered that we are our own worst enemy. Incurvatus in se. It was his way of saying that We are so intensely and overwhelmingly self-centered, we don't even realize it anymore. In Carvatus and say, the evil that I do. Like John Ferguson thought of. John, John's not only a pastor, but he's a he was a vet of the Vietnam War. And in the war, he saw a lot of atrocities. He saw a lot of evil. Which led him to say, in everybody there's two people. The Boy Scout and the killer. In every person there are two people. There's the Boy Scout and there's the killer. And that's a profound truth. And it's one that Jesus would have us pray Bring us, do not bring us into the the time of trial. God, God, please don't let me lose the Boy Scout to the killer. The deliverance prayer first helps me admit the reality of evil. There is the evil, there is the damage that I do. And then the deliverance prayer helps me confront The power of evil. I admit the reality of evil, but then I confront the power of evil. That is the evil that's done to us. There is the evil we do, but then there's that second evil Jesus talks about, and that's the evil done to us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus is saying, God, God, Rescue me not only from the evil I do, but rescue me for the evil done to me. Protect me, God. Not just from the damage within me, but the damage against me. Because it's one thing you see to realize. It's one thing to admit the the reality of evil, especially when it's in me. But I want to tell you, what will take your breath away is when you confront the power of evil, especially when it's against you. The deliverance prayer says there is an enemy who is stronger, bigger, and smarter than we are. The evil one, smarter, bigger, stronger than we are. And he's investing time He's investing energy. He is marshalling the forces of hell itself to do you damage. You remember the way, for instance, Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul says, you got to be careful. You're facing an enemy who is bigger, stronger, and smarter than you are. You remember Simon Peter? You remember Peter who says to Jesus, I'll never betray you, and then goes out and does it three times. Years after that, Peter would look back at that moment and he'd write in 1 Peter chapter 5, discipline yourself, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. 
That's said like a man who's been eaten alive himself because that's exactly what happened. We have an enemy who is bigger, stronger, and smarter than we are. And any addict in recovery can tell you, you and I cannot win this one on our own. Any addict dealing with brokenness, aggressive, oppositional brokenness will tell you, you and I can't win this by our own power. Rescue us from the evil one. God, protect me from the evil I do and the evil that's done against me. God, protect me, save me from the damage within me and the damage against me. And then finally, and most of all, the deliverance prayer makes me claim the defeat of evil. The defeat of evil. In the, in the end, this prayer is actually a victory prayer as we claim God's power over evil. Ernst Kirst, Ernst Kirst wrote the definitive history of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step movement. He named that history an intriguing title, at least intriguing to me. He named it No God. No God. He named that, he said, because he said most addicts have one deep problem in common, which is deep down inside, they are unwilling to admit their own responsibility, their own weakness, and their own brokenness, their own limitations. And Kurt said that health, that salvation, that healing, that sanity itself always begins with one response. And that response is for the act to say, I am no God. I am not God. I need help. I need a help from a power greater than myself. I need deliverance. I need to be saved from me. Well, folks, I want to tell you the story of the addict with her addiction is the story of all of us in our struggle with the darkness. All of us are in recovery. We're all in recovery from that anti-reality called evil. We underestimate, doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian, we still underestimate the violence that's inside of us. But we also underestimate the power of God's grace over that violence. And so we pray, do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. We know, we know, we know there's a power opposing the good in us and damaging the best in us. We know from life experience, we know and understand that there's a dark enemy of opposition going after all life and all life-giving things. But the only rescue, the only rescue from the evil within us and the enemy beyond us is the Lord above us. Isn't that what this prayer is saying? The only rescue from the evil within us and the enemy beyond us is the Lord above us. It's what 1 John chapter 4 says this way. Little children, you're from God and you have conquered. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. John says, you have a formidable enemy. But God's power in you is greater than that enemy. James, James, the very brother of Jesus, writes, Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God 
and God will draw near to you. James says, only in powerful prayer to a powerful God are we equipped to deal with the evil in us and the evil done to us. And so Jesus has us pray for God's guidance and rescue. And when we've admitted the reality and confronted the power that's when we're ready to claim the defeat that's offered us through the intervening grace of a living God. I'm no God. I am not God. I need a power greater than myself to be delivered. I need to be rescued. I need to be saved from myself. And so do you. So are you ready? Are you ready? to trade in your weakness for God's confidence? Are you ready to make the surpassing power God's defeat of evil? Uh, Erwin McManus. Erwin McManus, when his son was really young, his little boy was going out, going with some neighbors next door for his first uh, camp out. First camp out. Now think about that. Little boy, first camp out, first night ever away from home, first night in the dark, in the distance, in the wild, with all the things that go bump in the night. And little Aaron was kind of shaky about the thing. He was scared. Finally came to his dad and said, Dad, will you pray that I'm safe? And Erwin thought about it for a moment and he said, Aaron, I'm not only going to pray that you're safe. I'm going to pray that you're dangerous. I'm going to pray, Aaron, that you are so dangerous that demons will fly out of the room the moment you enter it. And Aaron thought about it for a moment. He said, well, okay, Daddy, but you pray that I'm really, really dangerous. Child of God, child of God, your heavenly father doesn't want to just make you safe. Your heavenly father wants to make you dangerous. The living God in this deliverance prayer wants to make you so dangerous that demons fly out of the room when you come in. Because only powerful prayer to a powerful God has the power to intervene in the evil we do and the evil done to us. So my hunch is this morning Jesus is praying for you. And the Jesus prayer for you right now is this. Do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from the evil one. Daddy, pray that we're really, really dangerous.